This evening we're going to, as I've already mentioned, uh, be following up on a theme from the morning message. This morning we did see that the Son does everything that He does as He sees the Father doing it, as it were, or at least as He's working, or sees the Father's plan, He submits to that plan, He does His will. We see that this plan of redemption is the Father's work, and He is involved in this. So we owe Him, of course, all praise and glory. But the Father is doing all these things through the Son in order to give honor and glory to Him so that the Son might honor and glorify the Father. So we do need to remember that, um, well, that really all three persons of the Godhead are involved in, in the work of redemption. We owe all three of them praise, glory, and honor. But uh, realizing what the Father has determined to do with His Son, we need to make sure that we're tracking with Him as it were, that we are seeking to do the same thing that the Father is doing, which is to glorify the Son and, of course, be comforted that the Lord will actually work everything that we see going on uh, for His glory. So let's, uh, let's read about that in Philippians chapter 2, uh, a very familiar passage. Uh, we're going to really be focusing on verses 9 through 11, but I'd like to back up to verse 1 and read verse 1 through 11, Philippians 2. This is what Paul, by the inspiration of the Spirit, writes. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in Spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now again, we saw this morning that Jesus again only did what he saw his Father doing. When he came into the world, he came in a role of complete submission to the Father's will. But it's interesting, you know, what it is that the Father actually showed him, what, what his will for him actually was. Because as we saw this morning, Jesus was given the authority to raise the dead spiritually, to give new eyes and to give a new heart, to give spiritual life. He was given authority to raise the dead physically in the future on the day when he comes again, He's going to speak and the tombs are going to empty out. And we saw that he was given authority to judge all the living and the dead. All mankind one day is going to stand before him. And they're going to have to give an account of their lives on that day. As a matter of fact, the Bible says we're all going to stand before him. Which is why we need to make sure that we are in Christ now. Uh, before we die, before that day comes... And the reason, of course, that the Father has shown these things to the Son, the reason why He had the Son do these things and gave Him the power to do them, as He says quite explicitly in our text from this morning, was that all might honor Him, even as they honor the Father. Now, the Father has a plan to glorify His grace in the salvation of His people. But the way He has chosen to do it was to send his son to do things for which the son would be greatly honored so that the son in return 
might honor the Father. So what I thought we would do this evening is basically see that this is the case and see how it is that the Father actually went about doing this, that it was his, his desire to honor the Son before Jesus came into the world. Again, we got a glimpse of that this morning from Isaiah 53. Uh, when he came into the world, and even now after he has come, the Father continues to bestow honor on him and will honor him forever. So first of all, let's look at what the Lord did to honor his son before he came into the world. And again, I thought it would be good to consider why it is the father wanted to do this. As we saw in our passage this morning, it's because he loves his son and he loves him more than anything else. Jesus is his only begotten son. John writes in John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John goes on to tell us that Jesus is the one who, even when he was on earth, was still in the bosom, he says, of the Father. He writes in John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. Uh, Jesus, we are told in Scripture, is the one that bears the holy image of God. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 1.3 that he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. And Paul writes in Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. The reason why the Father loves the Son so much is because the Son reflects his holy image absolutely perfectly. And what could God love more? What could the Father love more than his own image? It may sound, I mean, that would be vain for us to say that, but not for God because he is absolutely perfect. There is nothing and there is no one the Father loves more than his son, which is why he declared at his baptism in Matthew 3.17, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now we've asked this question in the past as we look at this relationship the father and the son have with one another and the great love they share. Does this mean that this relationship is exclusive to them and doesn't include the Holy Spirit? After all, we're talking about the triune God. How does the Holy Spirit figure into this? Well, according to Jonathan Edwards, again, the love that the Father has for the Son and the love the Son has for the Father, that love they share, is the Holy Spirit. This, in Edwards' view, is what it means that the Spirit of God eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is also personal, but He is the personal love of God, the love that He has given to each one of us so that we might love God and that we might love one another. Now, the Father loves the Son so much that He is determined from all eternity to give Him glory by giving Him the honor of being the one through whom God would bring salvation to the world and by richly rewarding Him for it. Remember, we read this morning in Isaiah 53 something about this plan. And again, this was a glimpse into the eternal counsels of God, which is His eternal purpose to honor his son and to reward him for the things that he would do. Isaiah 53, 10, 10 through 12. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Now, we know from the scriptures that it was the father, or excuse me, the son's pleasure to glorify his Father by giving his life 
for this work, for this plan, to repair the honor of his father. I mean, we had sinned against the father. We had violated his justice. The son was pleased to come in and repair the father's justice by providing a sacrifice, a payment for our sins. And by doing so, also to redeem those whom the father has chosen to love. But we also see it was the father's pleasure to honor the son for repairing his honor and bringing his chosen ones to heaven. Again, this is something that was planned from all eternity that the Father would do for the Son, the Son would do for the Father. Now we see the Father then from the very beginning um, give us glimpses of this honor that he was intending to bestow upon his Son and what he would do, of course, when he would come. From the very beginning, from the very fall of the first man and woman, he revealed his son to Adam and Eve. I think he did that to give them hope. Hope that there was reparation for the sin they had just fallen into. I mean, they, God warned them on the day that they had eaten of that fruit, they would surely die. And now they had eaten of the fruit, what was going to happen to them? Well, God didn't enact the curse, did he? He didn't destroy them on the spot and cast them into hell, but he showed mercy to them. He gave them hope. But he also did this to honor his son, who was the one who was going to give them this hope. He said in his curse upon the serpent in Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, not only did God here redeem Eve back to himself, because I want you to notice, well, if, if you might put the passage back up, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now, there's only two camps you can be in, the serpent's camp, in which case there's no enmity, or in God's camp, in which case you are at odds with the serpent. Basically, God was saying here he was redeeming the woman back to himself, and I believe he did in this case the, the man as well. And he told her also how he was going to do this. He, that is her seed, would bruise him, that is the serpent that just deceived them, on the head. And what he meant by that was that Jesus would crush the head of the serpent on the cross. And then pointing to the serpent, he says, you, the serpent, shall bruise him, that is the woman's seed, on the heel. In order to crush the devil's head, Jesus would have to die on the cross. But it was the seed, you see, that would save them from Satan's tyranny. So the father was revealing the son even back in, in those days to give them hope, but also to honor his son. Now, God told Abraham that the result of the son's work would be far more reaching than just saving Adam and Eve, and even more so than just saving Abraham's physical children, but it would eventually extend to all of mankind. After Abraham was willing to obey God, even to the point of sacrificing his own son and offering him as a burnt offering according to God's command, the Lord said to him in Genesis 22, verses 16 through 18, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now we've already read about the seed of the woman that was going to crush the head of the serpent. Here we read that the seed of Abraham was going to be a blessing to all the nations. And these two seeds are really just one seed. It's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul tells us as much. Um, in Galatians 3.16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed. That is Christ. So Christ is the one through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He is the one who would crush the head of the serpent and re redeem the woman and the man and all whom the Lord has chosen. God also promised David that this seed would be king over a kingdom that would everlastingly endure. 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 13. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. 
He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Again, talking about the seed of David. And again, the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. This is all referring to the same seed, David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, really, if we had time, I'm sure we, we wouldn't get everything that's in the Old Testament. But the father has many more things to say about his son. The whole Old Testament is full of prophecies, full of promises, full of types that were all pointing to the Son of God, to the Lord Jesus Christ. As we see in that discussion that Jesus had with the two on the road to Emmaus, after they had expressed their disappointment that Jesus, whom they didn't recognize at that particular time, in their estimation had not been the Redeemer that they had hoped he would be. Jesus said to them in response to their unbelief in Luke 24, verses 25 through 27, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. The Old Testament is full of references to Jesus because of the Father's desire to honor his Son in the work of redemption. And that before Jesus came into the world, even in eternity. But when Jesus came into the world, the Father further honored him. First, as you know, he appointed a prophet to go before him to get the people ready to receive him. Uh, the angel said to Zacharias, when Zacharias was in the temple, praying and asking that God might grant him a son, because he and his wife Elizabeth were advanced in age, they had never had a child. Lord, would you please give me a child? And the Lord dispatched an angel to Zacharias because God had a particular plan to give him a very special child, and that would be John the Baptist. Luke 1, verses 13 through 17. The angel says, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord." So John was sent and appointed to go before Jesus in order to prepare the way for him. But he was sent not only to prepare the way, but also when Jesus appeared to point him out when the time came for Jesus' presentation to Israel. We read in John 1, verses 29 through 34. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. So John was sent before him to prepare the people for him. John was sent before him to point him out on the day of his presentation to Israel. And as we saw earlier, the Father further honored him at his baptism by publicly declaring his love for him so that others may know of it. Matthew 3, verses 16 through 17. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We saw this morning how the Father honored Jesus by revealing to Jesus the things that was a part of his plan and by giving Jesus the power to carry out that plan. That's what all those miracles were about. That's what all that preaching was about. That's why Jesus is our prophet 
and our priest because the Father desired to honor him. And of course, he's also our king because after Jesus was crucified, after he was buried, the Father glorified him again by raising him from the dead and by showing him to many witnesses. He honored him not only by raising him up from the dead, but also by taking him into heaven where he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. The author to the Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 10, verses 12 through 13, but he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. That's, that's a very key point contained in our text, contained in the psalm we read. This is God's plan, and this is where we finally come to our passage because this tells us what the Father is doing now to honor his Son and what it is he, do, he intends to do in the future to honor his Son. Paul tells us in Philippians 2 verse 9, for this reason also so God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Now again, taken in context, what it means is because Jesus was willing to lower himself the most because he, you know, being the son of God from all eternity and equal with God, as we've already seen, he was willing to humble himself by becoming a man without ceasing to be God, without giving up any of his divine attributes, without changing in any way. And because as a man, he was willing to humble himself further by becoming a curse for us on the cross. Again, remember what that means. Jesus bore our sins. Jesus took our guilt. Jesus became a curse for us. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The curse that was due to our sins was laid upon Jesus. It was executed on him. Because he was willing himself to become a curse for us, God exalted him. As you've already seen, he's seated at the right hand of God. He's king over all creation. He's been given the greatest of all names in verses 10 and 11 so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now I know that we would all like to see this fulfilled all at one time. That would be great. We do know one day the Lord is going to fulfill it. We do know it's fulfilled in part. Remember Jesus, the, 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 you might say the, the New Testament church started relatively small, didn't it? Jesus gathered 12 men. They went around preaching the gospel and there were some who believed and of course at the end of his ministry, the vast majority of them wanted him crucified. But since that time, the church has been growing. Churches, there are churches in many different countries, many churches. Uh, that worship the Lord from Lord's Day to Lord's Day, who serve and honor Him with their lives. I mean, that's why we're here this evening, is that we might honor Him. That's why we live the kind of life that we do, is because we want to honor Him too. We know that right now there are demons in this world and also in hell. Some say that they're in hell even while they're in the world. And the souls of rebellious men who are definitely confined only to hell that know who Jesus is and they tremble. We know that there are angels and redeemed souls in heaven that continually worship him day after day as it were casting their crowns before him. So we know this is fulfilled in part. But one day it's going to be filled or fulfilled I should say completely. Everyone in heaven Everyone on earth and all in hell will bow the knee to him. They will do so either willingly or unwillingly, and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, it is the Father's desire to honor his Son that his Son, in turn, might honor him. And so the Father has promised to the Son that every day, or excuse me, one day, every knee, is going to bow before him. Everyone is going to bow. Even those who right now are doing just about everything they can do to dishonor him and to tear down, overthrow everything that he has established. 
you know, this is our hope that all the evil that we see going on in this world one day is going to come to an end. It's going to be overridden. It's going to be overruled. God's going to put an end to it. Now, that's something, of course, that we should be praying for and something we should be laboring for. It's not going to happen automatically. We need to do what the Lord calls us to do to bring it about. And that means, of course, seeking the Lord, seeking to live the kind of life He wants us to live, being those lights in the world. I know sometimes it seems futile, doesn't it? Sometimes it seems like it doesn't matter what we do. Nothing's changing. The world is getting progressively worse. Well, let me just encourage you through this text this evening to trust in the Lord. He is not only able to do everything that He's promised, there's no question that He actually is going to do what He has promised. He is going to bring His kingdom one day with great power into this world and put a final end to Satan's kingdom. I think the Bible indicates there's still a great deal that the Lord intends to do to honor His Son in this age before He brings the complete and final end at the end when He returns where we know at that time, particularly on the Day of Judgment, when He stands there as judge, every knee is going to bow to Him then, certainly. But even now, there are still many knees that are going to bow to him yet that he's going to bring into his kingdom and perhaps even those that may not uh, necessarily willingly do it from the heart but because the Lord is exerting his power with such force and I'm thinking here again of uh, the idea that God's kingdom is going to exert much more power in this world before the end of the age the Father is going to do much more yet to honor his son so that is a hope that we can hold on to. That is something we know He is going to do. Remember the Lord said that that stone which destroyed the feet of the statue that toppled it over and the wind that blew it all away, that stone became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. The kingdom of heaven one day is going to fill the entire earth. When the Lord says to His Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, all of those enemies of Christ, every single one of them, is going to be put under the feet of Christ. They're going to be vanquished. We know that that's the case. As a matter of fact, that's what the Father has been doing for the Son from the very time that He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's what the Father is doing to honor His Son. He is subduing the peoples under Him. And so let this be an encouragement to all of us to continue to love the Lord, to continue to serve the Lord, and not be afraid to stand up for His truth. Don't be afraid. You know, it's, there, there is, a, well, there is a saying that when, I like guess proverb, when, when evil men reign, the righteous hide themselves. That's maybe a statement of fact, but it shouldn't be that way. Uh, there's another saying that's very prominent in our culture, and that is when good men do nothing, then wicked men, you know, grow in, in their evil, basically. So we know what the Lord has called us to do. We know He's given us a charge. We know He's given us a commission. And so we need to seek to fulfill that commission and not be afraid, even though the culture is going the direction that it's going. God is going to honor His Son. He has purposed to do that. He has brought about absolutely everything that He said He is going to do up to this point. We have no reason to doubt Him and every reason to believe that He is going to complete what it is He has started. So let me just end with this encouragement again that we saw this morning and that would be for those of you who haven't yet bowed the knee to Jesus. Let me just encourage you this evening to do it now while you have the opportunity because the door of grace is open. The Lord says that if you come to Him, He will forgive you. He will receive you if you will submit to Him. If you will turn from your sins and trust Him to save you, He will save you. And let me just also say this. Sometimes we mistake the patience of God for acceptance, don't we? We think that because I'm living this kind of life and because the Lord hasn't really judged me for it, somehow He approves of what I'm doing. But we don't want to mistake patience for acceptance. The Lord will only receive us if we come to Him through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to surrender to Him. We have to repent. We have to believe in His Son. That's the only way that we can be saved. If you haven't bowed the knee to Christ, then surrender to Him this evening. 
And you will pass from, again, as we saw this morning, from judgment to forgiveness, from death to life. The Lord will completely forgive you, and he will receive you into heaven. And on that day when you stand before him, he will own you as his own child. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and let's, let's ask the Lord to increase our trust if we know him. And if we don't know him, give us the grace to bow the knee to him, that we might receive his forgiveness in His grace.